to order October 9th Board of Fair Commissioners meeting and as information for our audience if you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Metropolitan Board of Fair Commissioners today you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the board's decision to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact your own independent legal counsel. Okay, we're calling the meeting to order. Uh, first item on the agenda is to review the minutes from the previous meeting, which was September 11th. And these minutes have been circulated. We met, um, 50 Forward Center, the Knowles Center, during the State Fair. Move to approve. Second. So we have a motion to approve and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes are approved as submitted. I think we've been circulating that since 2012. I see that. Right? Yeah. Okay. That, um, all right. So uh, we have a public comment time to start our board meetings. And time is now. We have a podium here if you wish to speak. Three minutes, please. You can uh, state your name and address if you wish to speak at this, at this time during the meeting. No requested comments. We can move right along to our monthly reports. Uh, we have a financial report. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the financial report in your packet, um, starting with the very first page. Um, these numbers are preliminary numbers. I am currently working very uh, diligently with finance downtown um, to finalize our numbers. The month of June is still open, our fiscal year, um, as well as July and August. So um, there could be some uh, adjustments to these numbers uh, or reclassifications to these numbers. But um, for right now, revenue through September 2018 estimated or 707,665. The expenses are 731,593 for a um, net loss of 23,928. Um, and then when you factor in depreciation of 62,866, we're looking at a loss uh, for the month, uh, through the month of September of $86,794. Um, I would like to say that we are um, still, um, we have not finalized um, state fair. Um, so we just have the initial deposit of 50,000. Um, Scott and I are working closely to finalize those numbers. We should have another approximately $100,000 coming in from state fair. Um, we also have a little money coming in from the track. I can't remember how much, Laura, how much was that? 25,000 from the track. So that's not in these numbers that you're looking at here. Um, so um, what we have is showing us um, 86 in the, in the red, but when we add that 125 to it, it would bring us back into the black again. And those numbers will show up in October. Okay. Thank you. When do you think we'll have our fiscal year closed out? They're still working on June. They haven't closed it out yet, so they're still making adjustments. And I just uh, spoke with finance yesterday, and so they're still making adjustments to the, the fiscal year end. Um, the, uh, figure of our surplus account? Mm. So we were, oh, you're taxing my brain. We were at around six, a little over 600,000 in the account, and we used approximately half of that. So we're looking at probably 240, 
to 280 remaining in that account. We'll add that into next month's when we do finalize year end. <coughs> And then we have a few dashboards on the on the uh, last page where you can see um, how we're faring through September. As you can see, um, uh, the bulk of our revenue continues to come from flea market um, at 58%, um, and then building rental at 17%, and then other smaller percentages, uh, concessions. Uh, again, State Fair has not been added in the uh, entire balance for State Fair, um, but this gives you an overview of how our revenues fare through September in the in the chart where you can see it here. Um, and then our expenses, of course, payroll um, is the bulk at 29%, and then utilities coming in at, or IT services, utilities, 25%. Questions? Anybody with the questions? Thinking of adjustments, how uh, how's Nashville treating you so far? <laughs> I'm loving it. Still okay. getting used to the traffic. <laughs> okay. Uh, that never changes. <laughs> anything else on financial reports? Questions, comments? Uh, if not, we'll move on to our executive director's report. Um, <clears throat> most of my comments are, are going to be related to later agenda items. So during my time, I'd like to ask Scott Wallace to come up if it's all right. Um, we've got some really neat events coming up, and if Scott can kind of talk about those. We had a really busy weekend this past weekend as well. Or, um, one um, event that Laura asked me to talk about is going to happen on October 21st. Uh, Channel 2 um, and the, their, their ABC, affiliate, ABC affiliate here in Nashville, and they thought so much of this place that they are going to have the auditions for the Wheel of Fortune here. It's going to be between three and 5,000 people here that morning to audition. Pat Sajak and Vanna White have done commercials, so we're very excited about that event. They're going to be in the Creative Arts Building, um, and they'll um, come set up, and I'm excited about that on Friday, have cameras here uh, while they're setting up. So uh, the October 19th is when they're going to come set up uh, for it. So we're very excited about that. And that's going to be another busy weekend. Laura talked about the weekend we just had. We've had a, after the uh, fair and after the uh, flea market, we've been very busy. We had a great uh, September 29th weekend with the Hemp Show being here and other events. Last weekend, we had the Exotic Pet Show along with Tony's Race and uh, other events that, that weekend. And then this weekend coming up is another weekend that's going to be busy in October 20th. We, we plan on being busy for uh, until Christmas, actually. So we, uh, we're very excited about that. And, and as you see on your, we, we uh, and I, I want to ask if that, I keep asking Ned, but I want to ask you all if that calendar is what you all, um, is that easy to read? And if not, we can change it around and all that. So you can see uh, what we have coming up and all that. Is that something that uh, you all are, are want or would you like it another format? I never asked that, but I asked Ned. Ned's cool with it, but the others, if, that, if that's okay, we'll continue to send that out to you. No, we appreciate it. Yeah. So, again, October 21st, the um, and then that night, we are having the NWA uh, 70th anniversary. That's the wrestling night. Not the NWA, Aaron. <laughs> it's the wrestling. Uh, Jeff Jarrett uh, is the promoter. He's going to have, and it's already it's been sold out for like uh, ex actually about two or three weeks. So we're very excited about that weekend coming up. So as I always say, if you guys want to show up, let me know. We'll, we'll see what the promoter says and so we can come in and uh, enjoy yourself and any other event that we may have. Thank you.
Marianne, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you want to just give a brief update on the October flea and where we are? Market October. Without any problems, no parking problems. Thanks to Laura and thanks to the board. Right now we are. This is the 9th of October. We just now started opening the phone lines for new vendors. We have 2,003 booths already vended, and we have 649 dealers. So I'm sure our dealers will. It will go over 750 at least. I'm happy. I hope you all are. <laughs> Thanks. You're doing great. Thank you. So 2,003 booths and still renting, right? October's the biggest flea market of the year. So. All right. Um, <coughs> I'm done. You're done? Okay. I'm going to reserve my comments for each of the agenda items. Okay. All right. So we will move on to the Fairgrounds Improvement Project update. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I appreciate you all getting to me before I have to dart out to catch a flight. Um, I'm going to um, give an update on the current status of the budget um, related to the grandstand as well as where we stand with the fairgrounds expo and demolition. I think it's not working. Yeah. It's going to you just got to keep it really close. Um, and so in front of you, you have your usual dashboards. Um, the first one being the demo repairs and expo building. What I want to highlight here is um, primarily on this budget, most of the movement is related to design. So heavily involved in the design efforts for the building that is most of the movement that you will see in this budget which is in the design and engineering category and you also have the uh, project management and related expenses category which of course is paying for our project management time but at this time there is there are no dollars hitting the construction line items inside of this budget for that space we are working with Skanska to get their um, to get their sub on board for that, and we've started um, a lot of pre-construction effort, but none of that's been reflected as both this budget and the um, next budget you will see are about 30 to 45 days behind actual um, progress. If you look at the grandstands budget, uh, what you will see there, um, again, uh, not an entirely a lot of movement there. Um, there, are, there is construction dollar movement in the grandstands budget as we have been working over the past months to um, update and renovate the grandstands. Very little design work has been needed there. Um, again, as most of that work is renovation, so not a heavy lift, um, and then some project management time. If you look at the final page that you have, which is the overall total, um, which, which expresses the $12 million that have been given um, to the fairgrounds um, in the fiscal year budget of 2017, it reflects that $12 million. Um, as of the time of the creation of this budget, which was October the 1st, we had not received the funding information from Metro Finance related to the additional $25 million for the Expo Center, so it's not reflected here. But as of, I believe, yesterday evening, and I was notified this morning um, by Laura, that we do have that information now. So going forward, what will be presented is the compilation of those funds and a budget that reflects all of those uses uh, with anticipation of large portion of that going towards the Expo building. But we will, we will reflect that and we'll present it to you all next month. Any questions related to that? Questions comments from Laura? No, more just of a comment. Um, on page two with the grandstands, The the Bristol conversation is ongoing. 
um, as far as what their interest is in the track. Um, they are still in conversations with the Formosas. Um, I've, I've been tracking it insofar as we've got a, an upgrade plan. Uh, that's been in place. We've kind of done a phase one, which included paint, the bathrooms, and some lightings in the concourse. The phase two of that project is to continue upgrades to the grandstand portion. Uh, that piece is, um, there's a lot of work that went into that piece because essentially we have to shut down the grandstands for a couple months because of uh, erecting scaffolding uh, to do the paint, the lighting, and the PA. So I think, you know, by this week, early next week, we're, we, we definitely have to make a decision um, regarding what the relationship with Bristol could be and what, how does that impact, if that moves, if that agreement moves forward, what could that impact be towards that work? Um, I think it's, everybody is understanding that we do not want to spend uh, improvement money if that were to be impacted um, in, in a year or so. So we are kind of waiting, um, been in a con almost daily contact with, with the Formosas on that, and, and we will continue to figure that out. But it need, that decision needs to be made soon um, in order to make the decision on the timing on phase two. There are no questions about the budget. Before I depart, I would like to take the time to introduce Colonel Anderson, who Going to Pillars Development and will be working alongside our team managing the project for the new Expo building and sheds. Welcome, Con. We're glad to have Connell for sure. Um, so, quick updates on the progress that's happening there that kind of uh, relates to the budget. Um, Fair Park, of, of course, Commonwealth is still managing that. Uh, it's on track to complete this month, uh, this year, at the end of this year. We're basically waiting for the grass to grow. That's something that I think Jonathan would echo, and I'm going to echo his, his sentiment there. The grass um, needs to be approved by the design team to make sure that it's ready to park on. We're expecting that in the spring um, of next year. Sorry, can you all hear me? Sometimes. Going in okay. now. Um, there's also a site visit scheduled today with Skanska and the Commonwealth team for the uh, commissioners. So if you guys would like to, we, we're, we're planning on um, giving us a tour of that. So you can kind of see it for your own eyes what else is going on there. Um, also, the um, grandstands, as Laura mentioned, um, the grandstands right now is on hold. Uh, we've got the canopy paint, the PA system, and the lighting install. All of that needs the scaffolding, so we're waiting on all of that until we get further direction from the Bristol conversation. So for now, that's on hold. Um, then as far as the expo and the sheds go, of course, um, you know, once we had approvals, we have been busy designing. Right now, we are in the design and budgeting phases of that, so we're trying to tighten, fine-tune fine those designs and, and that budget. Um, that's what we're doing right now. We've also been able to bring in the pre-engineered building subcontractor under the existing contract. Um, and that's for preliminary conversations so we can keep that process moving and make sure that our designs are, um, are in sync with what we're going to be ordering. Um, a lot of that is because that steel is a long lead item, so um, we've been having to move forward with that so that we can um, keep that process going. The bid package number two, which is grading, will come out um, in a couple of weeks, about mid-month to later this month. Um, so again, we're not going to be starting any work, as Mary alluded to, um, until after the uh, October fleet. It's a big flea market. Having that parking is important, so we're planning on starting construction fencing and silt fencing after that. Um, but you'll see work happening here very quickly. So. Um, as Ed mentioned, no construction dollars have been spent on the expo as of yet, but we anticipate that will ha that will change this month um, with the pre um, preliminary construction work. Do you want to add anything to that? Uh, of course, I always want to add something. <laughs> um, just just very quick to to that. Uh, we're going to be doing. We've had one SMWBE outreach. Uh, we're scheduling another one probably early to late, early November, late October. Uh, so that's in the works. The infrastructure package is getting ready to be teed up. Uh, we 
We're waiting on funding and approval of that. Uh, we're starting the process of campus coordination and we're going to be working with Laura and her schedule and trying to merge a chance for everybody to get together with the stadium, the mixed use, and what's going on at the fairground so we all know what each project is going to be doing. Uh, the stadium itself, it's in the early phases of the design process. Uh, the, we're, the team has presented some stuff to us a few weeks ago. Uh, they've gone back, they're dealing with the same kind of issues that we deal with on Expo, getting it into the budget, making sure that everything is uh, going to be working from their perspective the way they want it to be. Hopefully we'll be seeing something on that in the next couple of weeks. The construction management, selecting the construction manager is in the final stages of negotiation. It's to go to the Sports Authority Board for their approval first in November. Did I miss anything? Do you have any questions? I just have um, one thing to add from a logistical standpoint. Um, Walsh Road, as it connects from Wedgwood to Nolensville, will be closed starting the week of October 29th. Uh, we will be producing signage, um, hopefully up by Monday of next week, the 15th, in order to notify drivers who utilize that connection between Wedgwood and Nolensville that that will be closed through traffic as of Monday the 29th after flea. Uh, that will be in preparation for installation of silt fencing and the grading that will occur. And we will also still share construction roads and event access. So we will make sure that we have an access road that does connect Nolensville with the interior of the speedway to help Formosa's out for the All-American for staging with that getting traffic in to the infield for infield parking as well. And then we'll share an access road that would be that Wedgwood extension as you take it through the property out to uh, well, right now it terminates at the creek, but we'll keep an access road there as well that we will share. So we will do a notification, both uh, media alert, we've notified um, Councilman Sledge, and we'll update, he's gonna put that information in his newsletter, and then that will also be updated on our website updates, uh, hopefully by the end of today. Or to add to that, we are also, um, just. To so working with Kimley Horn, which is the traffic engineer for the uh, soccer MLS, they're assisting on a construction traffic flow and parking phasing plan for during construction. So the goal is to have a diagram, a one-page diagram that can be handed out to vendors, that can be handed out to any events, um, you know, as well as up on the website. So there'll be something available. Um, we're aiming to get that in for the October fleet. Um, I'm curious if we have any pending uh, dates for opening the park and the park and soccer park yet? The soccer park? Uh, yeah, I mean, Fair it looks park. like it's Fair park. getting pretty close. Yeah, Fair park. Uh, yeah. You know, things still being coordinated with Parks and Rec. Okay. Great. Or is it waiting on the we, My understanding in talking to Director Odom is that we would do a soft opening this year when it is substantially complete, but we will do a more formal ribbon cutting in the spring. When do we let the dogs in? Uh, my best guess is December. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there... Um, any other update or concepts for during the construction phase, other parking off-site? Um. Yes, we continue to work with um, Public Works in discussing utilization of one side of the fairground side of Craighead for parallel parking. Um, also, there is, we've been in conversations with a local property owner uh, that hopefully we will be able to utilize their site. It's got about 300 spaces that could be available um, to us on the weekends. Um, and maybe we could do a trade because they're looking for some spots during the week. And so we're still working with that group to 
see if we can work something out there. About the metro. That that one is we we can park there, um, but it, there's just some certain regulations that go along with with the utilization of that. Yeah, and you need a safe way to cross the street. Yeah, there is a crosswalk um, at Wingrove from across Nolansville, but it is also across like four lanes of traffic. So you got to be really careful going on. So you know, if we've dis we've talked about with um, Bobby Burns of you know, if we do end up parking, say staff over there, it would be more of a staff parking that we would shuttle across just to be on the safe safe side. Because you know, when traffic comes down off of Fourth from downtown, not sure how much people are paying attention to crossing what do you think of that four idea? lanes of Christy. traffic. <laughs> You're not looking to get any more steps in each Yeah, day. no. No. Okay. Um, all right. Well, um, thanks for that. It, any other questions on that? I assume we've covered the MLS stadium. Oh, uh, yes. One other um, just comment. We, we continue to engage the user advisory committee. So this suggestion came out of the public engagement meetings that we had back in May, and I believe it was um, presented to us as an option during the flea market uh, workshop that we had, but it's made up of fairground stakeholders. So we have representation from State Fair, the Speedway, flea market, several different types of events that we have, our, our long-term large scale Christmas Village Lawn and Garden. We've got small new emerging events and we've got small expos. Uh, we also have indoor sports represented it and then a member of the uh, Friends of the Fairgrounds. So we utilize that group along with the design team to review site plans, review building plans. They've given us some really fantastic feedback. Um, we've made adjustments, pretty significant adjustments to the site plan. We're still finalizing that. We're, we're working with Skanska and, and estimating at this point and making some adjustments to make sure that we are in budget. And so we should hopefully, we, we, they keep telling me we have to nail that down very, very soon. So I think within the next week and a half-ish, uh, we will have um, need to just, I think, stop designing and make a decision and move forward. Um, I don't know if you've had any conversations with Monica or if Ron has any comments, but I saw we're in the Tennessee this week where, uh, I guess, Councilwoman Henderson, with the increase in the tax on the tickets for, um, a stadium improvements long term, and um, I remember I, I previously asked Monica of the, about that uh, during the initial discussions, and they felt sports already felt that it was, you know, we had an adequate plan to address those, and um, I didn't know. I have not. Like a poison pill of a type of proposal to. Okay. Anybody else? Comments? Uh, new business, we have consideration of additional race dates for 2019 season. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tee this up by saying, um, just as an introduction, that I was approached, gosh, months ago now, by a, uh, um, a promoter, Mr. Rittenberry over there, Jason right there, um, interested in bringing a new type of race to the track, uh, World of Outlaws. And with our contract with Tony, as you know, he is the exclusive motorsports promoter. So after that initial meeting, um, they have been working with the Formosas uh, in making some initial plans on how this uh, new type of race could be executed here. And we have also been just making sure that it fits within the schedule. So what you're gonna be asked today, they're gonna be presenting 
what the world of outlaws is all about, how it would be executed here at the Nashville Speedway, and then um, for your consideration, that would be an additional date on the 2019 racing schedule, and that's what you will be asked to consider uh, once you hear the presentation by um, Mr. Rittenberry and Mr. Formosa. All yours. <coughs> Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity for us to be here. I'm going to ask, uh, Tom's going to join me. Tom Deary is the COO of World Outlaws, uh, so he's going to be giving part of this presentation for us this morning. I uh, just wanted to start by briefly introducing myself. I did give you guys a, a one-sheeter. I tried to keep it very brief and to the point of who, what, when, where uh, about this event. Uh, but as Laura said, my name is Rittenberry. Uh, I would be the, the local promoter on this event. This is a joint co-promoted event between myself and my company here locally in Nashville and the World of Outlaws. So uh, the sanctioning body would be participating in this. So it's not just a, you know, not just a single local promoter. Uh, the sanctioning body themselves would be involved and would be the, the co-promote partner in this. Um, but I think Laura sent you guys some videos. So hopefully you had a, had a chance to take a look at that and at least got a feel for what the World of Outlaws is. Uh, but World of Outlaws is a sprint car dirt uh, racing series. Uh, they race coast to coast about 90 events a year. Uh, and this would be one of the newest events on their schedule. And uh, Tom and, and their group are really looking to make this uh, a large event. They do three or four large uh, special type events across the country each year. Uh, and this would be one of those. Uh, they've identified Nashville as, as everyone in the country has as an emerging market. And, you know, for us, it's a, I, I view it as a destination market. So the World of All fans uh, really within a, you know, four or five, six hour drive uh, would identify this early on, which is why we want to try to get this event nailed down and get it on the schedule as soon as possible while they're making their plans for, for 2019, uh, which events they're going to attend and travel. Some of their larger events are in Daytona, Florida. Uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and, and we would like to make this Nashville event uh, just as large. Um, so in the document in front of you there, it gives you a few of the details. It would be a two weekend event. Uh, the first weekend would be more of a local race, uh, regionally. Uh, and really the purpose of that is once we put dirt down, uh, and, I, and I did leave out of this document the dirt, it says at the historic Nashville Fairground Speedway, but this is only on the front stretch. So the, the, the quarter mile on the front stretch, not the entire, not the entire uh, five eighths mile track. So uh, would be a would be a small course, small track, uh, right on the front stretch. And I'm going to let Tom, you know, when he comes up, talk more about the actual track and the event uh, from a safety standpoint and and putting dirt on the track. He just got finished doing that this weekend in New York. So uh, they do have a lot of experience with putting dirt on asphalt tracks and uh, obviously getting that cleaned up and ready to go back to asphalt racing. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Tom and let him give you, uh, you know, a feel for the event and kind of what we're looking to do, and then we'll be uh, open to any questions. I'm sure you have many questions. Thanks. Good morning. What a better combination, the uh, motorsports legacy and history of Nashville and one of the fastest, most exciting, and uh, certainly one of the more popular uh, motorsports divisions, the World of Outlaw Craftsman Sprint Cars. As Jason mentioned, the, the Craftsman Sprint Cars, the World of Outlaws, raced 92 events across the country, and literally in front of thousands and thousands of people. We are enjoying a, uh, a great popularity right now and um, have worked hard to develop that relationship with our fans. The, this part of Tennessee, this part of the of the South has been kind of void without having a sprint car event here and what's better than bringing it back to the traditional uh, area, the, the motorsports history of the Nashville Fairgrounds. So we're pretty excited about the opportunity to do that and to present something exciting. A World of Outlaw sprint car is a purpose-built race car that uh, has a big wing on the top. It uh, goes very fast. They're 850 horsepower race cars. We don't need a 5 8 mile to put on an exciting and compelling show. It can be very, very exciting. It will be very exciting use, utilizing just the quarter mile on the front straightaway here at Nashville. Obviously, we have to bring in the surface. 
which uh, on, on first blush seems like a lot of work, but we're, uh, we as a company have been doing this at a number of venues over the years. As Jason mentioned, we just completed a four-day event at the Oswego Speedway in New York where it's a 5 8 mile track where we did bring in dirt, we covered the surface and ran for four days straight and have just completed that and the dirt will come off, they'll return it back to the pavement and they will run their normal season till next October when we repeat that. We've done it at a quarter mile track in uh, Illinois where we brought the dirt in, uh, raced on a weekend and then took it out and then by the next weekend they were back racing. It's not, uh, it's a lot of work but it really uh, is, is, makes it for a very exciting um, venue to say the least. The quarter mile here at uh, Nashville is essentially a pretty, is very flat, uh, which will have to do a little work to try to put a little banking into the, into the track, which may require some uh, fiddling with how we build the, the preliminary wall around the track. Um, there is obviously sprint cars, as I said, they're 850 horsepower cars. They're, they weigh 1,400 pounds, so uh, their weight to power ratio is pretty significant. And we want to make sure that we take all the precautions we can to both make the uh, spectators as well as the participants safe. So we do have to do a little work on the fence on the infield. That's something that uh, We'll continue to work and look at as we move forward with this. It's um, dirt racing is obviously a very uh, popular in the South and uh, it happens at a lot of facilities. We're excited about the first weekend, which will make this a regional event. Everyone will want to come and race at Nashville that because uh, they've always heard about it. They've uh, they know the city, they know this facility, so it'll give an opportunity for dirt racers all throughout the South to come and race. At, uh, at the Nashville Fairground Speedway. One of the uh, one things that uh, we'll get into the presentation and the events is that it's a very simple race program. We're not talking about long distance races. The feature event here will be uh, both on Friday and Saturday night of the sprint cars will be 35, 40 laps. So it's not a three hour race or a, what we're familiar with on the long NASCAR races or um, what they do for the All-American 400. It's a series of short races, qualifying races, and then the feature event is 35 to 40 laps. It moves along pretty quickly, um, and that's, that's part of the signature of, of what the Craftsman Sprint Cars are. It's a, a quick, fast, and uh, very exciting show. Caleb? Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Deary. Um, can you expound a little bit about uh, the uh, the safety uh, record of your organization, but also kind of the different items that you're going to be doing walls and ensure the safety of the track. Well, using the, utilizing the quarter mile, we'll be able to create a separation from um, through the through the for, through the turns and along the back stretch. We'll be able to create a separation of any people from being near the racetrack, utilizing the, the main grandstand for spectating. So. Everybody will be well behind the fences in, in all cases. Um, as far as uh, uh, safety with our organization, um, that's a, one of our priorities. Uh, as in all motorsports and all racing, we, we do have incidences. We do occasionally, uh, uh, there's uh, injuries that happen, but as far as keeping the, the race cars within the arena is our most important part, and that's, that's utilized either by the walls or the fencing and uh, as, as necessary around any facility. So will the dirt be on the track or in the infield? It'll be on the track. If you imagine the quarter mile just covered with, uh, with uh, anywhere from six to, depending on how we create the banking, six to 12 inches of, uh, of clay. A question, Mr. Riddenberry. So uh, I noticed you uh, used to be involved in the Kentucky State Fair, and I didn't know if you uh, had any advice for us. I was I was the CEO for the Kentucky State Fair, Kentucky Venues, so I ran all of the state-owned venues in Kentucky. I had uh, two convention centers, two arenas, the State Fairgrounds, the State Fair, and the Horse Park in Kentucky. So 
Uh, yes, I come from your world, and I sat in Laura's seat with you guys there for, <laughs> for a while, so I've been on both sides of the table here. Uh, unfortunately, I did not get out to the State Fair this year here. Uh, I did grow up here, so I grew up coming to monster truck shows on the front stretch at the Speedway uh, as a child. So uh, it's been a few years since I've been to the State Fair. I uh, was actually out of town most of the, most of the, uh, the time during the fair this year, so I didn't get a chance to come out. But I do look forward to hopefully next year I can plan some of my travel around that and, and get out to that fair. But uh, from, a, from a, my recommendation standpoint, I would just say that you've got a great person in Laura. Uh, you guys made a great decision with hiring her, and uh, we've known each other for a couple of years now. Right after she came to town, I reached out to her as I think we started about the same time. Uh, I started in Kentucky about the same time she started here. So uh, I was still living here even though I was working in Kentucky five days a week. Can you tell us anything about the um, the noise, the noise volume? I mean, that's something that is a concern to the neighborhood. Right. Well, we understand the the, the ordinance is 85 decibels. So, with mufflers on the cars, what should easily be, you know, be under that uh, for the entire time of the event. Okay. So that World Outlaws does. They run events with mufflers and without mufflers, and this one, you know, would be one obviously because of the neighbors and the location. Uh, that would require the mufflers. We do race in, uh, we, we race at a number of fairgrounds in California, which probably has the toughest uh, uh, noise ordinances there are. We do use a muffler package when we're at the fairgrounds in California, and uh, so it, it mitigates as much as it can. Um, Keeping in mind, they are race cars, they are powerful, so there is, there is an element of noise that will exist. The, the beauty of uh, these type of events is, as I mentioned, they're very short. It's not a long duration of, uh, of it's a, obviously a whole evening, but it's not like it's a constant uh, with the 25 to 35 to 45 lap events. Just give one clarification on um, I'm here. I'm seeing the sheet saying two days. I'm hearing two weekend. What what is the what are what's the whole arrangement here? The actual event days that will be racing will be four days, so it is two weekends. Uh, the first weekend, as we mentioned, is going to be a local regional race. Uh, it's not nationally televised. It's not on the large scale. You know, three or four thousand people uh, really is what we're looking at for that event. And the purpose for that is when you put the dirt down. Uh, we can't put that dirt down and immediately race on it for, with, the, with the sprint cars. Because of the power of those cars, uh, the, the dirt would just break up and it wouldn't be good racing. So putting that, putting that dirt down and giving that first weekend to get some of the local, you know, local regional racers, not, to the, not the national sprint car guys that are, that's televised, but some local regional racers, uh, the opportunity to race on that, that basically packs that clay down and packs that dirt down so it is safer for the for the actual World Outlaws weekend, which is the second weekend. So, so the, the local racing is, is the, the 23rd and 24th, is that? Yes, May 24. What does it look like leading into that weekend? Are there test runs during the week? I'm sorry? What does it look like leading in that week? Will there be test runs on the track? No, we don't. Once uh, there is a certain element of preparation that has to be done for any for the for the facility or for the surface, so we generally only prepare when we're ready to go racing. So it would be uh, very minimal uh, anything before or anything during that at this point anything during that week. What, being a large event, what, what's the car count that you're anticipating coming out for this? I, I, I know on, on your website you talk about a lot of different ranges and different cars and the rules that apply and heats depending on the car. So this is going to be a, at that larger end, correct? The, the Craftsman Spring Car Series field should be around 30 cars. Um, it's not a, not a huge participant base because it's, those are, this is the, we're bringing in the, the, the top of the dirt racing pyramid. So that's about a 30 car field is what we're hoping for on, uh, for the sprint cars. The previous weekend, the regional area, we could be in the, we could be about a hundred race cars total be over our, I think we have three divisions that we're planning. So there would be a, maybe even over a hundred. I really do think there's some excitement to come race, uh, 
race this city, race this event, race this venue. So um, we may capture some of that, uh, that emotion as well. What do you expect in terms of attendance for that second weekend? Right now, we're, we're budgeting and planning for uh, around 8,000 for the second weekend. That, that includes everyone, spectators, participants, so that'll be, you know, part, part of that number will be in the infield. That's not all in grandstands. Um, so for, for the first weekend, um, tell, me what, tell me a little bit about what the sort of the, the layout and as the schedule looks like with, with that many cars. I mean, what, how many heats are you, how, how many races is that going to be throughout the weekend for that with, that, with that kind of volume? We're, we're planning a three-division weekend, and each will probably be, uh, I'll just walk you through what a normal night would be. Uh, there is the hot lap session, which is usually three or four laps for each division. So you're probably, if uh, divide each of our divisions into four groups, so that's three times four would go out for hot laps, and there's a qualifying session, which is again two or three laps, which is that same group. Then a series of heat races, which would be about the same number. We'd divide it into three or four heats. We call our last chance showdowns, which is the last opportunity to get into the race, and then the feature events. So you're probably looking at a total of uh, different groups on the track. Each division will race, come on the track for hot laps, for qualifying, for heats, and features. So there will be 12 different uh, events that will be um, held on that first weekend by the groups. And the, the, the longest laps of that will be probably 30 laps, which will be the features. How you doing? Susan Jones, Metro Legal. I have a couple of questions. Um, one, could you give us some additional details about the fencing proposal in terms of who will be providing the adequate fencing and, and is fencing adequate for this kind of um, event? The first review of the facility is the, the fence on the quarter mile. We could use it. We'd have to make some additions to it. Um, we have to add a few more cables to it, at least one along the top. Uh, maybe a band of guardrail right along the top of the wall, uh, based on in certain areas, just to give the little more wall height, and then uh, to tie off the top with a cable. That's if we use the existing fence. We're also exploring some other options of maybe uh, additional bringing in wall pieces and building it that way. Okay. And would that be something that you all would do, whether you use the the current fencing and make those uh, modifications or bring in fencing, is that an expense that you all would be um, writing into your program? We, we can. Um, obviously, it's to be an improvement to the facility, and uh, so we'd like to certainly work with, uh, we would work with uh, both the Formosas as well as the fair, uh, fair Board to see what we need to do to, to step the facility up. Every. In my mind, every step of an improvement uh, to fencing is always, that's a great step to make and, uh, and, and is always reviewed very well. And with those modifications and or bringing in the additional fencing that might be required, would that, in your opinion, make that a, a safe event for, for us to participate in? Well, we, or, or are there any safety concerns that we there's should? always a safety concerns and yes there are and, and now I'll put my motorsport sanctioning hat on if it's not a safe facility for both the spectators as well as the participants we don't do the race we, we have taken that very seriously and that becomes part of what we do so we will make every every we will make every effort and complete that effort to make it a safe facility okay. are, are you Looking to create an annual event, or just a one-off event? No. This, our, our initial proposal to the Formosas uh, and to Laura was: uh, we would like to make this an annual event. We'd like it to be a three to five-year agreement. Uh, the current agreement that we're negotiating with the Formosas is a one-year, uh, with the option that we, you know, as long as we're 
all parties are happy after the first year, we will we will extend that for another two years. Uh, and we also understand that you know lots of things are changing here at the fairgrounds. We're, we're not sure what the future is. No one knows what the future could hold. So you know we understand that, and we understand going into that that you know things could change down the road. But our hope is to make this an annual event uh, with the dollars invested and the and the amount uh, of exposure this is going to bring. It's not really. Uh, our plan to, to make it a one-off event. In, in, uh, in that vein, in terms of the agreement really being between the World of Outlaws and um, the Fairgrounds Nashville Speedway, um, I'm assuming that you all are already negotiating as, as it relates to whatever the insurance requirements would be for that, but would you also be amenable to adding the Metropolitan Government um, and the Fairgrounds as an additional named insured for your insurance certificate in, uh, in light of doing the, um, doing the show? First part of that, yes, we're, we are in negotiations with the Formosas and the, the requirements are there for for what insurance would be required, and we do have that. We actually have that, and then quite a bit more uh, on top of that. From from our standpoint as a local promoter, uh, and we, you know, we would not mind adding Metro Government as additional insured for our side. Uh, and I'll let Tom address from from his side, from the World of Outlaws, uh, from an insurance standpoint. Thank you. Yeah, the insurance is that's certainly automatic. Um, as a company, we deal with uh, national sponsors that make us require have pretty high limits. So adding to the fairgrounds, as we do with any venue that we go to, especially where we have a lease relationship, they are additional. They are, uh, I don't know if it's additional insured or named insureds or whatever that, whatever that language is, but that's done, yes. Thank you. I want to make sure you gentlemen are, are, are you familiar with the curfew that that the, the current racing contract has and 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 are prepared to to comply with a with a with a similar curfew as to practicing and racing yes absolutely we were made aware of that very early on in our first initial meeting with laura and we are prepared to stay under that uh, curfew mr formosa what is your schedule leading into and coming out of this do, what, what races do you have in may and, and in june Do, what what are the dates of your races in May and in June? Right, right. What what are your existing dates though for May and June? Uh, I think actually in May is the Arca race. Are the okay. exact dates? Yeah, I think the Arca so race. I don't think the Arca race. The Arca race is okay. May fifth, is it not? May fourth. Okay. And then I think we have a race the second weekend in June. Yes. The next weekend after. The June. 15th. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we would actually begin construct uh, on May 13th. We, our agreement with the Formosas now is to rent the track from May 13th, or actually 14th, I think. We've moved it to the Tuesday, sorry. So May 14th uh, through, I believe, the Wednesday or Thursday after our event. Uh, just give us plenty of time to get in, get those walls built, get the, get the dirt down, get everything ready and prepared for that uh, 20, 23rd, 24th event. And then give us uh, obviously plenty of time for the cleanup afterwards to get the dirt off and you know get the track washed and clean and can you just talk a little bit more about the cleanup just in regards to any uh, dust and such we'll be in the middle of constructing hopefully toward the end of constructing our new expo facility which is going to be directly to the north of the speedway so i just want to make sure too that that dirt is continuing to be watered down at the end during cleanup so that we don't have any hvac challenges in our brand new facility <laughs> The, the actual, uh, I think the cleanup is going to be probably the easiest part uh, as far as creating dust or whatever. Uh, it is a dirt, will be a dirt racing event, so there will be, dirt will fly because that's part of what we sell. But we're also pretty good at managing it and keeping sure that the vendor, or the facility or the f surface is uh, appropriate so that it doesn't create huge dust storms and uh, 
but yes, that we were very conscious of not only your construction, but also for the comfort of our fans and our participants, as well as everything in the area. That's, that becomes one of our priorities as well. What does cleanup look like? What, it, what, what, dig in a little bit for me. What does it, what mean? Post the event? Yeah. Uh, well, if you can imagine, we're essentially just covering the pavement with a layer of dirt. They will come in and then shovel that dirt off and then uh, continue to sweep it and get it to a point where it's down just to the fines of the dirt at the end. And then they either use a water truck and a broom and kind of wash the pavement uh, to, to wash the dirt out of the pavement. Uh, as you all know, the surface of a blacktop is a little bit coarse, so the dirt gets down into the into the cracks, so they have to come in with brooms and water and wash it down, and then, then they clean it up from that end. And, and uh, you all will bring in the water truck uh, yes. to do that? Yes, yeah. Okay. Well, Question for, that's for Laura, but I'll wait till she's done. <laughs> um, in in terms of our agreements with with uh, the Formosas and the, for the racing, I mean, what what is the additional, or is there any additional revenue, or what's the additional for the fairgrounds in, in having these? As our contract is written, it would be parking, and a concession commission. Not track rental, this wouldn't be a no, track No, this rental. is, Tony is the exclusive motorsports <laughs> promoter. We, um, in that contract, all of that, since he is the expert, that all transferred over to the Formosas with, with signing that contract. Uh, and exposure, because I believe it will be televised. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sponsorships and... Yeah, absolutely. The World of Outlaws does uh, televise the event, so live the night of the event will be live stream CBS Sports, and then there will be a replay on the CBS Sports Network on television uh, a few weeks later. There will be national uh, national exposure, as well as the national sponsorships that are involved with, with the World of Outlaws. Obviously, we'll work with the Formosas on their sponsors uh, to make sure there's obviously no no conflicts or as few conflicts as possible. We're very respectful of theirs and the sponsors they have on an annual basis, uh, but we'll just be bringing in additional sponsors for this event. Uh, but we'll also give you know their local sponsors some additional exposure as well as the fairgrounds and the city of Nashville. A question for legal, I guess. I'm trying to understand the structure here um, um, because this is, the, the, these two weekends would not be part of the count for the speedway under the contract for, for Nashville Motorsports, so that which is that, that count is 10, right, for speedway events. So is this an amendment, Susan, to the contract that would that would just be that would contain all terms for these two weekends with with uh, the outlaw folks? Is that how it would be structured? That's correct. It would have to be structured as an amendment to the existing contract, both to the the um, for the addition of additional races, as well as, as I understand it, the nature of this kind of a race. So what you all did at the last meeting was um, you moved for an amendment to add additional uh, an additional race, and we've, we've spelled that out and we've uh, drafted that amendment for you. This would be amendment two to the contract, so it would need to contemplate all of these things that, that are being discussed today. Um, and legal upon approval of the board um, would, would draft that amendment for you as well for the chair to enter into along with the executive director. I think one thing that's important and I think that's uh, why it's good to have these kinds of discussions is that um, Mr. Famosa's cu current contract um, would not allow for this race as it is now. Okay, so as they're negotiating, they're going to be limited to negotiating to what his contract will allow. Um, and if you only approve for him to do this kind of a race for one year, then that's going to affect their negotiations. Um, if you approve, I think what was mentioned was the, the hopes of an option for three to five years. Um, that's something for the board to think about in its deliberations today as to what you want that duration to look like. Also, how specific you want to be in amending the contract. Do you want to make it specific to the world of outlaws, or do you want to make it a more broad wording that would encompass things like this in the future so that every time you um, have an, in 
uh, entity like this that wants to come or wants to amend the contract. You don't necessarily have to amend it per event. Either way is okay uh, legally. We can draft it either way. The last time I think you all wanted something very specific with regard to um, what you were approving, and we're certainly glad to to draft that for you and include it in a very specific way as it relates to the world outlaws in that particular race, as well as the um, the duration or the the uh, frequency of those races. <coughs> I hope that answered your question. Ms. Yes, Rizal. thank okay. you, Susan. I had a follow-up question when you're talking about the dirt. Um, when you're when you bring it in and during the races, um, like how much actually flies up? Will it stay contained within the track, or should we expect a film of dust throughout the fairgrounds and in the neighborhoods? Can you describe that a little bit more? Well, obviously during the event, it, it's watered, uh, so we try to keep it watered. And we'll, um, anytime there's vehicles on the track, it will be watered because it really does us. You know, does us no good out trying to, to form a track or to, to build a track when it's wet when it's not wet when it's just dry dust uh, you know the cars can't race on it when it's just dust and so uh, you know the the key to keeping that dust down is keeping water on it and so anytime that, that we get cars on the track we'll uh, we'll try to keep that water down but during the week in between the races does it stay watered or will the dust be flying up as during wind gusts or whatnot? Well, I mean, there, there shouldn't be much dust flying without, uh, you know, without any vehicles on it. I mean, if it's, you know, we get 40, 50 mile an hour winds, yeah, there, there, you know, there could be dust flying up, uh, but um, that's not something that's gonna, I wouldn't think gonna be flying to the neighborhoods and the neighbors around. I mean, the cars and the, and the things that are in the immediate vicinity inside the infield of the racetrack and maybe the grandstands could get some dust if we get some strong winds throughout the week, but uh, with a, with the dirt just sitting there on the track, no, it's not. It's not going to be just just flying up and covering the neighborhood. Okay, so cars parked in the neighborhood, cars parked in other parts of our property won't be covered with a film of dust. I mean, not unless there's there's wind that that causes that. I mean, w w with with normal conditions like today, uh, with the dirt on that racetrack, no. But if you know, I can't control the winds. If the winds do come and blow the dust, then yes, it it could get dust on things. On the flip side of that, May is a very rainy month in Nashville, and it is in a flood-prone area. So I'm curious if you've had any experience with a lot of rain <laughs> and the dirt tracks. Just this weekend. <laughs> Two comments. So first of all, on, on dirt track preparation, the key of making the surface work the best for us is that it be highly compacted. That's why we need the extra week is for them to come in, and they, they actually compact it to where it is unbelievably hard. So that helps us both in the in-between of any other kind of stuff becoming flying around, but they actually race uh, on a, the, the more compacted the surface is the better. Uh, this past weekend, we uh, over the four days, we had 20 hours of racing at the Oswego Speedway in Oswego, New York, but we also had 20 hours of rain during that same time period. So um, the, the racetrack was our the best part of all of it, the, the parking lots and the, uh, all the rest of the area is what was our bigger challenge. So yes, we're, uh, unfortunately, we become very familiar with working with rain and working around rain. Uh, one difference, however, is unlike a paved track where they will send out the jet dryers or the, the tow trucks and dry the facility, if we get too much rain, it does make it where we cannot we cannot race in the rain, and if there is too much rain, then it would cause the event to be uh, either canceled or postponed, uh, just because of that. And and I and I guess that's something that we would need to have that discussion if on the Saturday night uh, of this event, if we get you know 8,000 people in the grandstands and we're halfway through the show and we get a rainstorm, it's a uh, when we will finish that event uh, will, needs to be part of that discussion as well. And follow up on what Tom just said. I mean, typically what would happen there is we would we would finish that race on a Sunday afternoon the, the following day. So uh, could be a you know if it rains out Saturday night, we would be asking to be allowed to run on you know Sunday afternoon. Are we uh, taking a vote to move this along to 
be um, presented with something next month? It's the, it's the will of the board. Um, certainly, you know, if you're not prepared to take a vote today, you, you're not required to do one. A vote would be required, though, however, if you are um, inclined to allow for this race and to amend the contract. I will mention just one thing really quickly. Um, the middle date, so they would rent the speedway um, starting the 14th and run through June 1st. Um, the smaller of the races in that middle weekend is flea market weekend. So we do, um, we'll make accommodations for parking. Fair Park will be open at that point. We'll still have all the availability of parking up here on the hill as well as um, because Ron's gonna build our new facilities very quickly. <laughs> we'll hopefully we'll have that hard, some hard surface area um, prepared down by the new exposition facility. So it will impact our ability to park within the speedway for May Flea. Um, so we'll just have to work out, you know, parking uh, for that Saturday as well. Laura, what would be your preference for the board today, I and mean, I'm assuming you're bringing this to us because you think it's a good idea. Um, I, is with, with conditions and, and with the full understanding about the, I think we're all we have the same concerns for fencing safety, but I'm I'm absolutely confident in in Jason's um, you know commitment and the World of Outlaws commitment that they are going to install the necessary fencing uh, that is required. So I, I know for their, from their perspective, as well as, as uh, the Formosas in finalizing their race dates um, and getting it on the schedule and promoting that, I think that's really important. The timing is, is a consideration. So if you're comfortable with the information that you've been presented with today, I would be comfortable with going forward with a recommendation to, to approve the date. I, I may have missed this when I stepped out, but um, have you talked to the, the councilman for this district, neighborhood groups, other stakeholders? Uh, yes, we've, I, I have had some initial conversations with Councilman Sledge, as well as the neighborhood group, both uh, represented by um, Heidi Favorite. So I, I would say um, at, at the time of conversations, it was neutral um, until they got additional information and commitments from, you know, the promoter and World of Outlaws. Uh, I don't know, Councilman Sledge is present, if, if you have any thoughts or comments. Uh, yeah, I, think, I think many of the questions, sorry about the smoking. I think many of the questions um, that were brought up by the board were questions that I had um, in particular, um, especially regarding, it's always gonna be about noise, right? But I do think um, being open to different kinds of events like this that fit within the track, um, fit within what's being scheduled, I think is something that the neighborhood's open to. I mean, obviously I think there's gonna need to be a lot of accountability on it, and I think this board and Director Womack will help keep them accountable, but I think we're, open to considering new uses as long as they still fall within the same guidelines that uh, the Formosas are, are operating under as well. So, I don't know if y'all have any questions for me, but <laughs> thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Formosa, can ahead. we hear from you on this? I'd love to hear your opinion. We're really excited about this and you know a lot of folks know this a lot of folks a lot of folks don't but I was a professional racer here for 43 years myself I'm very familiar with with world of outlaw cars sprint cars and my number one goal for this facility is safety and I will give you my word that I will oversee this and that it will all be properly done. Um, we are not going to jeopardize anyone or any safety whatsoever. As far as the dust concern, I think I, I can speak a little bit for that. 
Basically, they don't just come in and put a regular type of dirt. This is more of a clay type dirt. And it, they, they pack it with water. So it's not like there's going to be just in a field and dust is just going to be flying. These cars slide a lot. And they, they actually leave black marks on the clay. So they're not all the time just throwing dust and throwing mud and everything. They're, they, they're built to hook up and, and get a grip. So the guys that drive them are, are very, very well qualified drivers. Their cars are light. They're very fast. They have a lot of horsepower. And uh, so my main go for this is the safety of it. And, and I think working with these promoters, these guys are professionals. They race all over the country. They very much know what they're doing, and I very much know the speedway and motorsports. So I promise you we're all in good hands with this. I will oversee it. I will make sure that the mufflers are implied and that the neighbors are satisfied. I've worked very closely with the Neighborhood Association for the past eight years, and I think they're very satisfied with, with, with our performance here at the Speedway, and we will continue to do that. Thank you. Any further discussion, or is anyone prepared to make a motion? Um, I don't know if we make the discussion before or after. Yeah. My concern that I, I and I received from some people in the neighborhood group was was not particular to to these folks. Um, it was it was the sort of overall race count, and I think that that that's the thing that's giving me pause a little bit. Is I don't know where we are with with Bristol, and I'm somewhat concerned that we may be presented with a package at the fair board by Brist with the Bristol folks that's far down the road and higher powers such as the mayor's office have made some sort of agreement that we're sort of expected to pass. And so the, the, the place I'm getting at is I am a little concerned not so much about this particular package, these, what these folks are proposing, but this is two more weekends and then what comes next from Bristol and then, you know, that's creeping up towards 17, 18 weekends, which is, you know, and also condensed during the spring and summer months. And as we've seen here, we're looking at May 3rd and 4th weekend, May 23rd, 24th weekend, uh, May 31st, June 1st weekend. It's suddenly a lot of weekends, and then if we're squeezing in two more, two more higher, I don't know how many weekends extra from Bristol, uh, which is another whole other thing. If that, I don't know how many they're looking at. We have no idea. Um, so that's, it's not so much the individual merits here. I'm kind of just wondering about where we're heading, and I am not comfortable I'm comfortable talking about adding one or two race weekends here or there. I think that's fine. I think we can talk about good packages. I start getting concerned when we're talking about adding four, five, six racing weekends a year. That's a big change, and it's 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 a lot. I think it's a lot for to be born in this setting, um, where um, just with with all due respect to these folks, the, the rest of these tracks are in very rural areas, and so we're talking about a totally different setup here. So. That's the sort of I'm looking to kind of have a broader conversation about how 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 many weekends are we looking to have racing, um, and how dense of a how dense of a concentration of them. Um, I just don't I don't know. This put us at 13 weekends of racing. Is that right? 11. 11. Yeah. Got it. So is it is for the 19 cool. for the 19 schedule? You guys are only scheduling nine. But so the ARCA is getting the count. I thought the ARCA was a separate contract of two weekends. It is, but we count it. Okay, so I'm trying to I'm just trying to get to the total count. Jason, my contract allows me to have eight. Okay. Motorsports events. Right. The ARCA race will be the nine. Okay. So the ARCA is nine. And then is drift on the schedule for 2019? Not yet, no. If, if, if the Bristol deal matures, I think they're talking about two races. A, a truck, a Craftman truck race and a bush race. And I think they're looking at doing those both in one weekend. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that would actually be classified as, as 
they would be doing two races, a, a Infinity race and a Craftsman truck race, and it would be a Friday and Saturday event. So it would one just event. kind of be like classified as one event. It would just be a two two day show. So it wouldn't be like you would be adding two more days. Because it would just be one weekend. So you could count the Bristol deal as one event. That's helpful. Should we make a motion to uh, have further discussion? And, and another thing that I might add that, that may help the situation was this ordeal that we did this year on changing the date of the All-American 400 was simply because we had other national events <coughs> that we have to turn our schedule in so early in the year and there were other national events scheduled on top of the All-American 400 original date. So this is not something that we're going to try to do every year. It was sure. only to help our attendance for this year. Sure, so, I understand. You had scheduling issues, and there were there weren't just logistically correct. able to get people here. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Wait, oh, Tony, while oh, you're up there, um, have you uh, been to tracks or talked to other promoters at other tracks that have had these races and been able to see the conditions afterwards and know that it's okay for future racing? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Willing to, uh, you know, if any other board members or, you know, have other thoughts, but, you know, I feel good about the concerns that were raised, about the noise, the, um, you know, dust, environmental um, concerns, and cleanup insurances from, you know, Mr. Formosa. I know we, we have a larger, you know, um, deal about the Bristol out there. We can't really make, you know, bring that, I feel like, into this discussion because we don't know what that is yet. And, you know, I've the, the onus is really on these promoters if they want to do more races to do a really really good job uh, you know this time and with the neighborhood groups and others uh, you know, not it, you know, feel good about it at this point I'll, I'll make a motion to I'll make a motion to um, approve an amendment to the contract um, um, on, a, on a for for a uh, for holding um, these events with, with the World of Outlaws as proposed for 2019, um, um, subject to the terms of the existing contract with, with uh, uh, Nashville Motorsports. Do we have a second? Second. And I'm happy to discuss, discuss that further from there. Where we go? I think, uh, just to your point, I mean, or to your amendment, uh, you know, I know they talked about having a separate agreement or their agreements I'm not having an option. I just want to make sure the fair board is still going to have that option to renew that. Well, yeah, and, and I'm happy to have discussions about that, I, 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 how we word that. But I, what I, the thing, I think I, the thing, and then they're turning this back down to, to this relationship in particular, I think, I think we know the Formosas really well. Um, uh, uh, Jason and Tom seem like good folks, professional folks. We don't we don't know them yet, and so, and we don't know about um, this format of racing yet. So, I think I'm happy to I'm happy to accept a friendly amendment. However, you all want to talk through it, but I think my goal is is that the fair board has the unilateral ability to choose not to renew if we see things that don't work with this relationship after one year on a, on a basis. I, I just, I, I, want, I want to preserve the right of the fair board to have that discussion, that's all. Um, and we can word that, and I'm happy to discuss giving both sides, but also but I want the fair board to have that right just because it's a new relationship. I want us to have that right a lot with, I mean, I don't want to commit to something brand new, especially when it hasn't gone through the RFP process. Um, it's, it, this is a new relationship and being done in this way. I want the fair board to have the right to choose if we not, now, hopefully it goes great and this becomes an ongoing thing and we can work that out, but I want to have that right. Same here. Maybe it's a question for legal, because I was just, I was just saying, I don't know if it's a, they have an agreement with each other and then we have this separate amendment or, you know, I'm just, they've already had this agreement and it needs to be written in this and it's obviously adverse to what we want as a board, so. Right. Well, he, he, Mr. Formosa can't enter into an agreement with them until after your approval because he doesn't have authority in his current contract to contract for anything outside 
of what is here, and this is not contemplated in his contract. So currently, he doesn't have authority to enter into such a contract. As I understood it, he's in negotiations, and it's an ongoing talk, and it was probably contingent on what this board decided. Um, to Mr. Bergeron's um, um, point, as I understand it, you're saying just for the 2019 racing season, correct? Okay. Yeah, now, <clears throat> that would work. That would handle the concerns that you're 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 uh, sharing at this point. And you can always, just like you've done an amendment here, you can always go back and amend it again if you see that after <laughs> 2019 you want to move forward and allow for additional optional years. Certainly, that's something that the board. Uh, could do, and and quite frankly, you don't necessarily have to wait until that, um, right? Even until that race, but yeah, I, I, I just think that, and I'm I'm happy to reword it if anybody has any ideas on that. But I, I do think just under the circumstances, um, especially because it hasn't, this hasn't been sort of vetted through a full grading or a PP process with a whole written proposal and everything like that, and it's a new relationship. I, I just want to be able to see how it goes this year, and if it goes as well as everybody seems to be planning for it, that's something we can account for further. We've got, we've and, had this kind of fair. I'm, I'm sorry, ahead. also, um, to, to your, both of your questions, um, and I'm not their attorney, so I'm sure their attorneys will probably tell them something similar. I mean, they can always write a contingency in their contract that, subject to the fair board's continuous approval, they can make their option contingent on that as well. It's just another, there's a couple of different ways you could do it uh, legally to where if they wanted to contemplate something like that, it still would be contingent on, on you all's approval. So, um, <clears throat> would, would our amendment, would it serve us to address fiscal liability for the safety updates? Yes, please. Let's do that. That's a good idea. I agree with that concern. Just because that's going to be an agreement between the two of them. I don't know if these safety updates would benefit you or how they would benefit you or if you would would be willing to pay for part of it, but I don't know how that affects us and affects them. Like, that's just a question that I well, don't think should It sounds like it, it definitely has to be a two-step process. We give initial approval today. Maybe we authorize executive director and legal to bring back next month how it, and you guys have to come to some meeting of the minds as well. And then we have presented to us uh, final amendment in regard, yeah. It was Sounds like they, they would like to ask the facility to think about these guardrails and other things that impact a different type of race. Um, we've been talking a lot about safety in different regards, and we know that the, uh, the track could be upgraded in that regard. There are potentially some discussion to ha be had on that, on that matter. Um, so I don't think we can address that right this minute today. Unless somebody has another. No, there, it, there is a, additionally, there is a, a term in our agreement with the Formosas um, that if, depending on value of any upgrades to the track does require fair grounds. Um, so it would go through myself um, for review for any track improvements with a value of over $5,000. So that would naturally go through um, Metro review prior to installation. And I think that's what all parties are asking for is to make sure that it's, this is a different type of event, make sure it's safe, you know, if the. It's, I guess it might be a question for legal um, and, and just, I don't have a copy of the existing Speedway contract with me. Um, if we execute the amendment as being discussed here, um, are you aware of any fiscal requirement upon the fair board under the Speedway contract where the, as a result of entering into this amendment, uh, the fairgrounds would be obligated to make any sort of expenditure in furtherance or as part of uh, fence construction or anything like that? Would there be any obligation on the, on the fair board in that regard or on the... I, I, I'm not aware of any in the contract. In fact, I was looking at something that might actually read to the contrary. It says uh, that part of Mr. Famosa's uh, duties under the contract are to produce FSN events uh, for which FSN has performed activities and bear all costs associated with production. So it, it seems to read in the opposite <clears throat> to answer your question. 
And, and then I also defer to, to Ms. Womack. Is there anything that you're aware of? I was not aware of anything else, but I, I am not, okay. no. That being said, definitely broaching the topic of, I guess, pr could you present us with a separate um, concept of what type of safety measures you think would be required, you know, a specific design and plan so that we could look at that? Uh, sure. I mean, I, th I think that's something that we can absolutely provide and provide to this board and provide to Laura and to Tony. Uh, obviously, prior to the event, it's not something that we'll address once we get here. Uh, Tom's actually has some folks coming out today to look at the track while he's in town. Uh, so they will be looking at the, that today and see what our options are. Uh, as, as he mentioned earlier, we, you know, we're looking at two different options, reinforcing the current fencing that is already in place uh, in the infield, uh, as well as bringing in our own walls and our own fencing and our own, you know, all of our own fencing for the infield area of the track. Okay. Those really, really are two options. One, it's uh, are we going to, going to invest in a permanent capital improvement to a facility that we don't own, or are we going to bring, you know, our own walls and fencing in? It's it's an expense either way for us. I mean, to ship those blocks, it's not cheap. Uh, you know, we carry two to three to a to a semi truck, so uh, the, the transportation cost on those is is very very expensive. So from our standpoint, it may be more beneficial to put uh, that improvement into into the permanent facility here versus us bringing in temporary structures. Uh, I think the term of the agreement would definitely play into our consideration for that. Uh, you know, we can invest in bringing temporary structures if we think there could be a chance we're only going to be here one year. So, I um, mean, I think that was going to be the one question I had on the term that, that is on the table now. The option is, are you are you approving the event for multi-year unless something goes wrong and you have the right to cancel that, or are you approving it for one year and we have to come back here a year from now and get approval? Two, two different types of agreements and two different scenarios for us. Uh, we're, we're fine with the fair board having the right to, to terminate the agreement if something goes wrong, uh, but I think in our you know our, our option would be obviously to, to have that option to exercise. Uh, as long as the Formosas are happy and we're happy uh, without having to come back to the fair board to present this all over again and, and look at this uh, discussion again. Uh, it's a significant investment we would make to bring this race here to start up a new event. You know, the money to be made, the profit in this obviously is, is down the road. It's not in year one. So uh, as with any new event, it takes a few years to build. Uh, so, you know, from our standpoint, that's what you know we would ask for if we if we uh, blatantly do something that's uh, that's unsafe or you know it, the neighborhoods aren't happy with, and and the fair board has that right and option to terminate the agreement. Um, but we would obviously our choice would be preference would be to have that option to be able to exercise with Mr. Formosa, uh, unless you know something clearly goes goes wrong uh, on our part. Just to be clear, Mr. Berger, again, the the former is what is the motion, correct, just for 2019 as of right now. That was and the intent all, of my motion. Okay, and you all are discussing that, but that's the motion that's on the floor. I just wanted to make, sh make sure. <clears throat> Currently, we would be approved for one year, and we would come back to the fair board after the 2019 event for approval again. That's the intent of my motion that I proposed. I mean, the, the way I feel about it is, uh, like I said, I mean, we, you know, when we, when we signed the five-year agreement with, uh, with the Formosas, we had the benefit of a, a long history with them already. Also, the had benefit of them winning, uh, winning a competitive RFP process, um, and, um, uh, you know, I, th I think I would liken it to some of the dis negotiations with the, the uh, in national soccer holdings uh, regarding the operating agreement. There were some interim proposals from the folks at National Soccer Holdings about um, um, things like giving giving soccer holding holding soccer holdings to certain standards like the curfew um, for concerts, but saying the fair board shall approve any extension of that and not be unreasonably withheld. Well, effectively, that what that proposal would have done was make the fair board approve any extension the soccer team wanted to go past that curfew. It would have made the concert curfew kind of 
without real effect. And so my concern is, is any language along the lines of, well, unless something goes wrong, well, then it's a question of, well, did it go wrong enough, right? And I, I, I just am, don't know that, for my part, uh, as to my motion, I'm comfortable just with the newness of this relationship with the fair board giving away any more authority than just sort of having this one year right now to sort of see how it goes and having the you know having to re come back and reassess after that um, uh, I just don't I, I just don't know if I'm comfortable seeing the the fair board go any further down the road right now or make any uh, further you know sort of commitment that's 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 what's behind my motion does the investment in the safety measures have an impact on whether it it could be a successful one-year event versus multi-year? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if, if we're talking one-year only with the option of, you know, we, we may not be able to come back, you know, that, that's going to that's gonna change our scenario and, you know, quite frankly, change our thought process on the entire event uh, because, it you know, we had planned on this being a, a multi-year event with a, with a two-year option with the Formosas. Uh, if that's not the case, then we'll have to evaluate this differently from a financial standpoint. We, you know, I can't come in and put, uh, you know, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars in improvements in a fence uh, to improve the safety for for a one-year event. Uh, we would we would bring our own more more than likely. Uh, there would be a chance that we would, you know, bring our own our own walls and our own fence and 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 do that versus putting it in. Now that's not to say that Mr. Formosa and I couldn't work out some agreement where, you know. We're providing part of that. He's providing part of that, or, or we work that out in our in our lease agreement with him. Uh, it's not going to affect the safety of the event. It may affect how we how we go about making that event safe. I just want to be clear. In in either scenario, we reserve the right to cancel the contract. It's just essentially a difference of intent, right? That is that. Well, I guess it's the it's in the detail of the language, right? And I I, I mean I I. I um, I guess if, if the language of the amendment is that um, it's a, you know, we have options, but but they're completely non-binding and the fair board has the right to, can't, to cancel the contract for any reason whatsoever, um, that doesn't seem too different from what I'm proposing for one year. But I don't think that's what these, I think what I think I'm hearing um, from Mr. Rittenberry perhaps is some sort of language that sort of says, set some standard and and I could even be okay with the standard but it needs my concern is is it uh, I don't want to then be in an argument in in or in a position in July of 2019 where both where uh, you know with all due respect because I see these legal fights every single day uh, uh, the folks from outlaws are saying well there's no reason we, we this option has been extended and there's no reason you have to cancel it um, that that reason or that concern isn't of that isn't one that reaches the standard so that's that's the thing I'm gaming out is I'm worried about getting down in that path I just I don't there's too many unknown and this all goes back to it's a lot of unknowns and I guess maybe this, what this all goes back to is I think what I would have maybe made me more comfortable today is, is having a, all of this information worked out a little bit further now because my concern with at doing a multi-year agreement with options that limits the fair board's ability to sort of reassess after a year, I don't have the kind of information I would want today to be able to commit to that, is, which is why I've made the motion the way I am of what I'm willing to approve. Uh, one thing I'm just thinking about is the the safety concerns if we knew a little bit more about that and if it was ten or twenty thousand dollars there might be something that we would I mean, personally anyway speaking for myself be inclined to try to approve anyway because it's it's we're gonna even if it's overkill f for what we're doing um, other events whether it's monster trucks at the state fair or events like this if there's a uh, industry safety recommendation that these installing these things permanently and here's the expense here's the design and, and everybody can examine that and sign off on it I, I don't know I think we would be inclined to add additional safety features having some budget to do that which um, we do we're trying to work through a plan and there's a lot of variables here uh, in motion but uh, that might solve some of their uh, issue as far as a multi-year um, 
I think we'd be, we definitely, I know we'd definitely be interested in hearing about what the safety improvements suggested would be, and we could take a look at that. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other comments on that. I think Councilman Sledge even mentioned that it's a different type of event, having different types of events that bring different curiosity, different fans, different uh, opportunities for folks to come enjoy the facility, I think has some appeal to me personally. Sure. Using yeah. the, the racetrack for other interesting, uh, fun, creative, you know, touching other uh, fan bases. It's definitely a different demographic than the fans that are coming to, to Tony's events now. And I think he can, you know, he, he would agree with me on that, that, you know, dirt track fans and asphalt fans are, are two different groups and two different, uh, two different sets. Not to say that the folks that come out to his event aren't going to come out to this event because it is a race and it is here in Nashville and it's local. But, you know, the folks that are, that are dirt track racing fans, uh, typically aren't going to, to asphalt races. And I come from both of those worlds being, you know, my background being in NASCAR and in, you know, dirt track racing and drag racing and road racing and Formula One racing. So all those are different, different demographics and different groups of people. And so this will expose the facility uh, to, uh, to a new group and a new set of, of racing fans quite different from uh, the current weekly racing fans for the asphalt racing. So I mean, I think um, the opportunity to have private investment in, into our safety at the track has some appeal. So, but what would that language look like so that we would continue to be part of the um, decision making on, on year two and year three? Um, Susan, is there a way to structure that language so that? We would still stay involved. The way, um... the, the current motion doesn't contemplate that. Um, what you could do is um, maybe amend the motion as it exists now to allow for continued negotiation uh, by the chair and the executive director on that issue. Um, and then ultimately require that that issue be one that comes back before the board. That's one way to do it. <coughs> um, there may be other ways to do it that could be explored during that continued conversation. Um, but that's, that's one way it could be done if you want it to move forward with the motion today. I think just one other comment is I think that, you know, as as we move forward over the next several months, especially in light of SMI's interest, we're going to have to potentially revisit how several things are done, not necessarily just this event, but, you know, obviously working through the Formosas too on any further improvements to the track that may be proposed as part of that consideration so it's it's again I don't that said I don't want to um, stop all programming for what ifs so it's just something that we're gonna have to keep in mind and work together on but again I don't want to I don't want to prevent new programs um, for speculation either and I want to get to a solution today. I, I don't want to. I don't want to make these folks wait till November. Um, certainly, I know they they want to get to work and they want to start promoting. Um, you know, and, and I think that that making them wait a month is is. It, I just I wish I wish the the presentation was a little more today flushed out. Um, and and that's, but I mean I, I'm willing to add an amendment to to provide options in the amendment to extend. But I still want the fair board to have the right to terminate after the first year for any reason. Um, because I just don't know what is going to happen this year, and um, I don't want to see the board placed in a in this in a commitment for multi multiple years for something we don't know about. Um, that's my concern. I, may oh. I ask a question yeah. um, of the promoter? If the board were to defer decision on this today in an effort to give you an opportunity to work some things out with uh, Mr. Fumosa as well as 
Ms. Womack with regard to fleshing some of these issues out and come, coming back with a hard copy proposed amendment that would encompass all of the issues that have been, where does that put you as a promoter for this event? <clears throat> I think our choice would be if, if, if we had to choose A or B, uh, I would take the one year the one year approval today, okay. just because we're right now we're holding up World of Outlaws releasing their schedule for 2019. Uh, so we we've been holding that for this one particular race and for this board meeting because this is an important event for the World of Outlaws. Uh, they've been kind enough to you know to work with us on the timing and the releasing of this event and announcement of this event. So if I had to choose A or B, I think we would choose the the one year approval with the option of the fair board to cancel for any reason uh, and then we you know we perform uh, and we're, we're confident of that we're not you know we're not going into this thinking man we, we want this three-year approval because we're not going to do this thing right that that's not my intent and, and uh, I'm saying it all but uh, we would choose I think that over let's stop everything today come back and present another next month right, okay. uh, we would take that one year approval and then we would be glad to come back and make a presentation at a future date okay. or to work with Laura and Mr. Formosa on uh, the plan for the safety and how we you know what the financial structure of that is uh, right now the, the the agreement that we have been negotiating uh, requires us to make those improvements. It doesn't say if they're permanent or temporary. It just requires us to make those improvements, and we're, we're committed to doing that. We're, we're not going to run the race without making those improvements. But if there's a way that we could work that out with the fair board, where our private investment in, in capital improvements of the facility uh, was a benefit for both parties, we obviously would, would love to continue that discussion and to okay. continue those negotiations. I think today what we're just looking for is the approval of the date so, yes, we can announce the event uh, and to continue negotiating our contract with, with the Formosas uh, moving forward. Let me, Thank you. Let me ask a hypothetical, Jason. If, if say, we had an agreement, say the, the, there was an agreement that Mr. Formosa brought forward tomorrow that was for a, a uh, with SMI to make a, a race, this is all very hypothetical, uh, SMI to make uh, a race weekend with, with the kind of, with, uh, I know Xfinity truck was one night and whatever it was the other night. Um, and hypothetically, SMI was coming with the capital investment in that to make safety, safety upgrades, which I assume would be necessary for that type of racing. Um, um, would that type of safety upgrades to accommodate that race be adequate to accommodate outlaws the for, fencing for example for for the exterior for the outside fencing the uh, absolutely i mean the, the improvements they're going to have to make for a nascar event here would would obviously be adequate for the racing we're doing uh it's just a matter of how much they would do on on the infield because that infield the pit road basically fence between the pit road and the and the infield is the area that we're more concerned with. We're not as concerned with the exterior fence. We're we're good with it. It's that interior fence. So, it just depends on how much you know SMI was willing to put into that and what NASCAR would require on that infield fence. Um, Understanding, of course, that's all. Yeah. Very hypothetical. All right. I think we have still a motion on the table. Um, it it sounds like. We need more information on the safety concerns and how that would be funded, and and we're I think at least I know I am personally willing to have some further discussion at another meeting, um, and I believe the board in general is willing to whether it's SMI or your group something that's timely that needs to be moved on. We we can have special meetings. We can. Uh, Get together quickly for something that needs our attention and approval. So, uh, if everybody's ready to vote on this particular, I'm sorry, we voted motion. on the original. Yes. Yeah. And maybe yeah. we could re recap. Um, Christy, capture the, my my wording. <laughs> I usually have a court reporter to. <laughs> From 2019. 2019. So that would not contemplate <coughs> renewal. Right. And I, had, 
I similarly had jotted down some notes on the, on the motion to approve, approve the event for 2019 subject to the terms of the existing contract. So we essentially have the same thing. With our vote, I'm sorry, Erin, go ahead. No, no, you uh, go ahead. With our vote today, I mean, that gives them the opportunity to put out their schedule and whatnot, but it also means that they can continue talking to Tony, continue talking to Laura and Ned if they want to come back with a more robust safety proposal and uh, continue to talk about a two-year option. I mean, that still remains on the table, correct? Agree. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, I, I would, yeah, if, if we get sort of a really granular, fleshed out plan, especially that sort of kind of lays out what the costs we're looking at and why, you know, they need to sort of um, capitalize that over over a multi-year planned event. I get it completely and and I'm happy. I just, without seeing that, it's really hard to kind of go down that road today. But I think we're, I think everybody, it seems like there's a, everybody on the board <laughs> is ready, willing, and able to see that whenever. Um, but we get we, we can get them what they're asking for today, which is immediate approval, and they can get moving for 2019. And we can, just like we've had a lot of discussions with a lot of stakeholders about the fairgrounds over the last year, we will have we'll have new folks to have discussions with. And I think everybody's done a good job of working on that. Um, and Laura has been fantastic about bringing everybody together. So she can continue to do that. Call a question. Okay. All in favor? Good one. Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The motion passes. All right. Thank you for. Yeah, thanks very much. All right. Recreational vehicle rules. That would be Mr. Wallace. <laughs> it's, uh, we, as you know, we have RV parking here, and part of the agreement with our uh, persons that, that stay here is that they understand the rules and the regulations of the fairgrounds, and they sign off on that. Well, uh, we didn't have anything written. We just did it verbally, so we decided that uh, we needed to put something on paper. And this is, uh, as, and this has been vetted by uh, uh, Susan Tucker, Attorney Jones, Tucker Jones, um, and at her request, we would want to, for you all to look at it to make sure that these things are what we're supposed to be having and, and that we can now hand this out to each RV persons. And we're revamping a little bit because of the construction. Um, we're gonna lose some, we're gonna gain some, and we wanna make sure that uh, we streamline everything from now on. So at the request of our attorney, Tucker Jones, we, she, we've been asked to uh, have you all look at this. And um, if you have any questions for me, I'm, I'm here. I think it looks great. I have, I have two notes on it. Okay. And, and just to share with you, uh, the, the staff had come up with a great, um, a great letter, and, and so I thought, well, since these are essentially rules, and rules really need to be approved by the board, we wanted to bring it to you all to make sure you didn't have anything to add or change and whatnot. So we welcome any suggestions that you might have. Awesome. Um, one suggestion I have is to make the um, <laughs> the rule contemplating pet refuse a little bit more like a rule. Right now it says it's very friendly. It says be sure to pick up after them. I would say that it needs to be a stronger That's a, must. <laughs> a yeah. stronger rule that um, you must pick up after your pet. Yes. Um, and then the other thing, just to avoid confusion for you, is I might uh, specify um, at the bottom the contacts that you're the weekday contact and that Danny is the weekend contact, so you're not both getting phone calls regarding the same thing. Thank you for that. What about exotic pets? You've those? <laughs> they were here last weekend, <laughs> <All right>. so <laughs> yeah. They, but you know, I'm not looking for them. So okay. <laughs> um, the, you you address this a little bit about privacy of fellow guests. I think um, you know not not disturbing their uh, um, what's the right word? Is there like a curfew? Yeah, um, not disturbing in general, whether it's noise or right. At you like for us to add that to it. Yeah, to that. The, letting them enjoy the 
privacy of their tenancy, you know, their. Are, are there curfews at the, I mean, like a quiet time curfew and whatnot? Not specified. We don't have any curfews um, for, for that. We do lock the interior here at 11 o'clock, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I would maybe suggest you look into that. I'm, that's, as Caleb was saying, that's pretty common at campgrounds, like, you know, 10 to 7 a.m. quiet hours or whatever. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and the other thing is, do they do they pay ahead of time, or how does how does payment handled? It when they some pay ahead of time, some pay when they get here. Um, we uh, the reason why they, they, we we kind of frown on them paying with credit cards. One of the things why, before they get here is that it's a charge to that, and also when if something happens and they can't come, then it takes a long process uh, to get them their money back. So we kind of. If we can't avoid people paying with credit cards, we, we try to. Should there be a rule that talks about payment? I mean, I, that just seemed like an obvious thing that would be addressed, um, and I didn't see anything regarding that. That's what you'd like for us to do. We, we would be glad to do that. I guess. Uh, Adding to that, um, I know when Ken was looking at this a few years ago, we were looking at doing like a reservation, online reservation system. Is that, did that ever get set up or do we do anything? We haven't. We set them kind of, we've set them up um, because certain weekends we do fill up. Yeah. So we do have a, uh, not a too comprehensive, it's more of a, a spreadsheet that we use to reserve, especially during the flea market weekends. Uh, they take up a lot of our RVs, so we don't have anything, any software, anything that we have right at this point to do the reservations. But we do, we do um, have spreadsheets and things like that that we use. How is the payments being handled right now? Payments are handled by the flea market office. Um, if someone comes in, we direct them to the flea market office to uh, pay by a cash check or credit card. Um, if they come after hours, we have we we if they come during the weekend when the flea market is over after it's closed, we would ask that they would either pay by credit card or we would get them that morning. Yeah, uh, I guess the only other thing I was thinking about too is is maybe look at other campgrounds uh, around the font, maybe a fine if they, you know break the rules or something, leave pet trash, whatever, just to have something in there that we could enforce if needed. Be happy to add that as well. Yeah, it's part of the payment. Thank you. What, what is the status of like outdoor fires? You mentioned fireworks, but fires. Fires, we don't allow fires at all. Okay, might put that in there. We are all very interesting. I know. <laughs> Oh, this on a bad day. <laughs> no fun allowed. <laughs> Any other questions? And would I need to make these revisions and bring them back to you before we start? Would that be in order? Okay. You might circulate them um, that way. If we think of anything else, we could. Right. Well, can it, would that be appropriate if I circulate this and then you all add it to it? We can do it like that. Yeah. So I'll make sure that I have everything yeah, in order. Yeah, just circulate your next draft, if okay. you would, please. You know, uh, I'm fine if, the, if we want to designate someone instead of waiting a month to, to look at it, but up to the rest of the board members. Nominate Bana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can just update it and send it to me. I'll That'll work. I will. Okay. Yeah. And I think this is a great amenity that we offer, so thank you for staying on top of it. You still need a motion to approve subject to the changes that you've identified today uh, and upon uh, Ms. Johnson's approval. So moved. <laughs> Second. Second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor? All right. Aye. Thank you. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Um, I'd like, uh, Mr. Jones, would you mind uh, chatting with us a little bit about uh, fair, the state fair that uh, occurred, and uh, maybe a little bit about the future? <laughs> Well, um, as far as the 2018 State Fair, um, a little bit well rested now after that's over with, of course, but uh, took a little little time to get over that. But the event itself, as far as production, it went well. We had a uh, really good fair as far as um, public safety rides, no injuries, as far as um, 
leasing of the fair, had no incidents to speak of. Um, the last six, seven, eight years, you know, we have really worked really hard to, um, you know, wand and, and do things that keep the riffraff out of the fair and, and let the families have a really good experience. Um, overall, um, you know, we had really some good events, well attended, some I think you, you attended yourself at the ham breakfast or opening ceremonies. Uh, we did have rain during the fair, of course, uh, opening night. We, it came about 7.30. Um, and then, of course, um, we ended up having rain all day on Sunday, which is our fourth largest day of the fair. So we were pretty much trying to play uh, catch up from that. Um, our preliminary numbers on the fair were probably down a little over 5,000 in paid attendance. Uh, we just just uh, couldn't really make it up. Um, Saturday, it was a, a good day, the last day of the fair, but it seemed like being a little warm, it seemed like everybody wanted to come to the fair at five o'clock. So we uh, tried our best. We parked cars inside the racetrack, filled those parking spaces up um, around three o'clock, and then we moved outside uh, the racetrack gave that parking lot about two hours to kind of clear out so we could go back and refill and then re um, just bring on around to the back side of the racetrack uh, traffic was backed up all the way down wedgwood the interstate uh, had reports of about a mile down the interstate and of course no one's road was backed up past 440. Um, the the real issue it's kind of like uh, we haven't had um, uh, two-way traffic coming into that parking lot because normally what we do on the weekends is Wedgwood Avenue parks in this lot, Craighead turns and parks at the Five Points, which is now Fair Park. So what we were really trying to battle was in that evening time, you have two lanes of traffic coming in and of course, once you get to a point, they all have to turn to, to move basically the way the design of that parking lot, it's just the way it's designed with the fencing and the roads. Uh, people tend to drive real slow, they like Christmas time, and they're wanting to get a front row parking spot. No matter how hard and how many people uh, you put out there, waving them on, they just tend to creep along, which backs up traffic, and there's nothing you can do. Uh, um, having two-way traffic in a parking lot is, is just not a not a good idea. So basically we ended up um, at a quarter till 10, we closed, our gate, closed the gates to the fair to enter at 10 o'clock. So normally we cut parking off about 15 to 10 minutes before that allows people to park their car, walk and get to the gate to buy their ticket to get in through the fair. Um, there was cars, we ended up ultimately having to get uh, uh, an area of police, uh, they called them in to bring a car because the traffic was so backed up, no one's road, those folks were not very happy because we just couldn't, couldn't accept them anymore, basically, because of the time constraints. So, but all in all, I mean, the parking is gonna be a big issue. That's, we knew that going into this, of course, uh, and even moving forward, parking is gonna be um, something of a challenge, so. Um, but the rest of it, we're, you know, as far as the, the event itself and having a, a good family, clean, safe event, um, that, that is definitely our number one challenge and that's what we work the hardest for. So. Okay. Um, I know you've had some meetings with design team and staff about uh, future design of the Expo Center, any uh, feedback or update? There? Well, I mean, the, the meetings all in all as far as, um, you know, the building and the barns, I um, mean, there's, of course, we have just, the concept of the buildings and the barns is pretty much um, what we have talked about um, when we try to get into details. You know, those things come a little bit later, um, you know, everything from, from electrical drops to type of surface, manure pits, all a lot of that stuff um, is not really uh, something to talk about really right now because I know the buildings, the overall concept is where they're looking at. Um, but as far as that part of it, I mean the buildings, I mean there are some concerns about ingress and egress. 
RV parking is, a, is definitely a, a concern for us. Um, I, livestock parking, I think we'll have that maybe figured out. We still have to figure out um, how to um, get those folks in and out and come back because they'll have to kind of loop around. And then, of course, public parking, uh, handicap parking. Those are going to be issues. Uh, you know, I've been racking my brain about even if you have off-site parking, the shuttles that will have to load the handicap uh, wheelchairs, uh, scooters, um, they just take longer to move people. Um, always going to be a challenge. Um, of course, in the new fair park, you not we really can't have handicapped parking on grass so that's going to be a, a huge challenge for the flea market and the fair and everyone that uses it um, and then of course once they're on that side we have to get them to the other side and there 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 again you have some type of a shuttle you know and a lot of that is is all about experience and I'm sure Laura can add to this um, more and more people are handicapped I mean, we filled our handicap lot up that we have designated for the fair. Um, it's a number that I don't really see going down with our aging baby boomers. So they are people that uh, want to come out and experience the fair and other events. So that's something that we're really going to have to take a, a long, hard look at how to um, be able to, to move those folks timely manner and in a way that, you know, that it doesn't disrupt uh, everyone else, you know, because of the, just the time constraints it takes to, to move them. You know what they do in Wilson County, Williamson County for, for handicap accessibility? They have designated parking up front closest to the buildings. But in this design with the buildings, everything, I mean, the way the footprint will be for the event of the fair, uh, we will be. Um, using every square inch for the fair, livestock, uh, trailer parking, as far as, you know, just, it's, it's going to be a challenge, especially during the years of construction of the other mixed-use events, uh, build, uh, properties. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Any other business before the board? The motion we adjourn. Reminder of the tour afterwards. Yes, we do have a tour. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.